I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's meeting of the new faculty success program. Today we're talking about universal design for instruction and learning with, uh, with a sidebar on providing accommodations for students here at San Diego State University. I'm really looking forward to the presentation by today's guest speaker, who I will introduce in a moment. But first, SDSU's land acknowledgement. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy. Now, I know I'm keeping our guest speaker waiting in the wings, but before I go any further, I'd like to introduce a member of the new faculty success program team who many of you have not been able to meet yet. Nava Amuna, standing over there by Allison, is an instructional designer here at SDSU. Nava has been providing invaluable support for, the new, for new faculty orientation as well as this new faculty success program, primarily through helping us plan and execute the asynchronous parts of this program, the amazing Canvas course that you're all enrolled in. She's been so helpful. She's an essential part of our team, even though we haven't gotten her a t-shirt yet. That's on me. Please give a big round of applause for Nava. Welcome, Nava. Thanks so much for making time to be here. I hope you get yourself some lunch, too. Today's special guest speaker is John Rizzo. John is an instructional materials design specialist and senior instructional designer here in San Diego State University's ITS unit. I took a workshop from John in my first semester here at SDSU, and I've learned frequently from John over the uh, 19 plus years that I've been here. I have always found John to be knowledgeable, up to date, as the many recent badges in his email signature will attest. <laughs> he is a patient instructor and an unfailingly gracious colleague, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome him here. Please join me in welcoming John Rizzo. <clears throat> Thank you so much, DJ, for such a, a graceful introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm an instructional designer here. I've been here since 2001. So um, I just want to say hello to everybody and lots of new faces here. Um, I think I've met some of you during the new faculty orientation. But uh, today we're going to talk about universal design for learning and also touch upon accessible instruction and student uh, accommodations here. Um, I will call upon a couple of uh, guests in the room in just a little bit to introduce themselves. But uh, let me go ahead and proceed. I'd like to show you a movie. You may have seen this already, but if not, uh, it's worth seeing again. Or if you have, it's worth seeing again. Students value the opportunities to feel welcome and comfortable regardless of background or ability. SDSU is committed to promoting diversity, which includes disability. Here are tips that help give all students the opportunity to learn and succeed in their courses, ensuring they leave SDSU with valuable experience and skills they need for life. Create a welcoming environment for all students that emphasizes mutual respect. Welcome questions, seek out the student's point of view, and respond patiently. Students' privacy, including information about their disability, is protected by the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Invite students to meet with you outside of class to discuss disability-related accommodations and other learning needs. Don't make assumptions about your students. Keep in mind that some students have hidden disabilities, and others do not disclose their disability. Include the disability statement on your syllabus. This is required at SDSU and can be found in the SDSU Accessible Syllabus Template, which is maintained by the Center for Teaching and Learning. 
Respond. Respond to accommodation requests from the Student Ability Success Center as soon as possible. This allows Student Ability Success Center staff time to caption videos, study terminology for instruction via sign language, digitize text, and more beforehand so that the student does not fall behind in their coursework. Note that students may notify you about their accommodations at any point during the semester, not simply during the first week of classes. The Student Ability Success Center counselors may be able to answer questions regarding appropriate accommodations, but the students are the experts in how they navigate their disability. Be proactive in making instructional materials available in advance of semesters to allow adequate time for alternative media coordination and distribution. An example of this is providing book order information to the bookstore when requested. When using zero-cost course materials and open educational resources, submit the information about zero-cost course materials and open educational resources to the bookstore, including the title, author, publisher, and ISBN number. This helps the Student Ability Success Center find the item when the materials need to be converted to an accessible format. Keep in mind that many universal design for learning instructional approaches, such as recording your lectures, displaying captions, posting your notes in an electronic format, facilitating note-taking, and using descriptive language to describe your content, help disabled students and other students in your courses. Thanks for watching. Okay. Thanks for watching. Um, Questions about anything contained within that movie, and I want to make a few corrections also. So this movie was made a little while back. The Student Ability Success Center has changed their name to Student Disability Services. As a matter of fact, I've got some uh, close colleagues here with us today. So uh, two staff members from the Student Disability Student Disability Services. <laughs> Elizabeth Crosswaith, who is uh, our captioning coordinator, and also Candy Ray, who is our um, accessible, technology. accessible technology coordinator. Okay, so um, uh, they're here to uh, add moral support, also just to associate faces uh, with names, different things like that. So uh, they do a lot of work for our students. So. Uh, very pleased to have them here today. Any questions about what we saw in that video? We will go through a slide presentation and talk about terms, techniques, resources in a few moments. But any questions about anything so far? Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Will you talk about like accommodation for like exams, like coordinating with students with disabilities? Yes, we sure will. We can definitely talk about that. By the way, <coughs> Part of my role here is to act as a liaison to you as faculty members when you need to accommodate a student. So you say, I don't know how to do time and a half. Um, I need to get something captioned. How do I do it? Different things like that. I'm definitely one of your resources. So come to me and I can definitely help you with that. As a matter of fact, I'll make it a, a priority because we want to make SDSU a welcoming place for students with disabilities. If you learn anything from your time with us, uh, that would be my overarching goal right there to make it a welcoming place for students with disabilities. Okay. I'm going to just jump into a PowerPoint here. Okay, and let's see. Um, I am going to ask for some volunteers today, and I hope I don't have to call on somebody, okay? <laughs> Anybody want to read this out loud, very loudly, to the rest of the uh, group? Uh, go ahead, uh, Lizzie. Okay. From the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008. The term universal design for learning means a scientifically valid framework for guiding educational practice that A, provides flexibility in the ways information is presented, in the ways students respond or demonstrate knowledge and skills, and in the ways students are engaged, and B, reduces barriers in instruction, provides appropriate accommodations, supports, and challenges, and maintains high achievement expectations for all students, including students with disabilities and students who are, lim who are limited English proficient. Thank you, Lizzie, wonderful. Um, so 
This is universal design codified into public policy. We're going to look at the scientific evidence behind universal design for learning in a few moments, but I like to boil universal design for learning down to two major principles. There's actually three, but I kind of stick with the two. Um, one is multiple means of representation. All right, so if you are showing a video, you turn on the captions that actually will help uh, students who are uh, deaf or having um, hearing uh, are hard of hearing. Uh, but actually, there's empirical evidence that it also helps students who are ESL. And it actually helps everybody else, OK? I recommend you turn on captions on a movie or video you've seen many, many times before. And I bet you're going to pull out extra information, especially when there's dynamic volume changes, explosion, and then a whisper, OK? So it can be hard to hear that whisper. Also, uh, I turn it on when I'm watching Shakespeare because it's early modern English. And if I miss one word, I missed a twist in the whole plot. Did she drink hemlock or not? OK? Oh my gosh, that's a big deal. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> uh, so we're going to look at more examples of this. I just want to show you the empirical evidence, actually. It's compiled by the Center for Applied Special Technology. And this is a consortium of neuropsychologists and clinicians from Harvard. In the 90s, they were asked to go into different schools and see why this student wasn't doing well. Actually, what they did, they went in and they found out that the curriculum was at fault and not the student. And they needed to do things to adjust that curriculum to the student, like multiple means of representation. If I go to their site, and I'm, this is up on the uh, CTL site, our new faculty site. If I click here, I won't spend too much time on it, but here is where the compiled research evidence is. So engagement, representation, and action and expression. So for instance, under representation, and I've got that nice zoom bar in front of me. Let's see if I can actually make it go away. There we go, good. So under representation, language and symbols, and then support the decoding of text and mathematical notation and symbols. So uh, how many people have seen a speech to text widget inside of Canvas? It's called the immersive reader. Have you ever seen that? So you know, on every page in Canvas is a button. You click it, it's going to read text to you and highlight the words, all right? That is speech to text technology, and there's empirical evidence that says you comprehend more when you use that. I tell you what, when I'm using, when I'm going through an article or reading something dense, you know what I do sometimes is I turn on the sound and I listen to it instead. Actually, I tend to pay more attention to it. And I can, you know, kind of recline, give my eyes a rest. So I use this myself. But I just want to point out this, uh, there's a bunch of articles here that back this up empirical evidence. This is in our slide deck, so I'm going to let you explore it on your own time. OK? But I just want to point out that website and then come back here to uh, my presentation and talk about more examples. So there is an immersive reader in Microsoft Word also now. OK, there's also the ability to dictate into Microsoft Word. So it saves you time. It may not be perfect, but it's getting better. And you go back and touch it up, all right? Uh, there are alternative formats found in Canvas. Believe it or not, your syllabus can be downloaded as an MP3 file uh, or other things. We're going to look at that in a few moments. But that attends to multiple means of representation and also equity issues. Believe it or not, we've heard of students who have to go to their closet, take themselves offline to get away from family members and study, all right? If they download the MP3 or a PDF, they no longer need even internet access to study that material, OK? So we're going to look at that in a few moments. Um, other low threshold things like turning captions on. So multiple means of representation here. Now, multiple means of expression. You know, and, and there is no perfect example or definition of UDL. So I open it up to any barrier that stops or impedes students from learning. So community, welcoming environment, different things like that. So allowing students to introduce themselves with a video or text in a Canvas discussion board. So they've got that option, 
Okay, and also it builds community, it gets synergy going, gets them talking to each other. Um, what else? Um, oh, very low stakes assessment. So if you go to law school, guess what happens in your class? You get one big test at the end, all right? And then your score is put up against the other students. Talk about anxiety provoking, okay? <laughs> um, so the opposite of that is having multiple means of assessment throughout the course so that students can build uh, their knowledge, they can gain practice and confidence. There's even evidence to point out this may stop them from cheating on exams because they have the confidence. So those multiple means of representation, I'm sorry, multiple means of expression. We've also had students who, you know, do presentations. They do a song as the final project. Uh, they do visual poetry, all sorts of things. So they may not be the best test takers, but they are good at you know, singing or something like that. So multiple means of expressing their knowledge, all right? So just want to point that out on this slide. Again, this is gonna be in the Canvas site. The, what's the official name of our Canvas site, Nava? Uh, new Faculty Success Program. Okay, awesome, New Faculty Success Program. Um, and I just wanna give kudos to Nava. She is my colleague and she has some serious course design chops. So it looks really good. Everything I make looks like it's from the 90s. I don't know what, what the deal is, but. Um, <laughs> so what is accessibility? I'm going to ask somebody to read this slide. And let's see, any volunteers? Uh-oh. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, what is accessibility? Accessibility is an important facet of UDL. Accessibility means that a student with a disability can access and effectively use materials in your course. UDL and accessibility are related, but they are different meanings to reiterate. While it can vary, course materials that are universally designed are open, accessible as well, uh, using videos and caption. Videos okay. Caption. So yes, so the idea is, and you have to take in mind uh, the context, your instructional context, um, different things like that as far as how much uh, time you can spend on certain things. And we'll talk about prioritization also, but um, uh, captions are a great example of UDL, which is uh, also accessible. So as a student comes, they need to watch the movie, it's got captions already, so they don't have to request them. Just like a student who uses a wheelchair, when they come up to the front of the classroom, to the door, uh, there should be a, a ramp to get them in there already, okay? So this is proactive. And again, as, in, as faculty, I realize there's a lot of competing things, uh, competing priorities for you. So um, it's something that we'll talk about uh, how to chip away at. Okay, so where do I start? You want to prioritize the frequency of use. So a video that's going to be up on the internet shown to 10,000 users, probably you should have it captioned, right? Uh, but maybe you're giving feedback just to one student in Canvas. Now you can go to the speed grader and actually record an audio or a video to give them feedback. Maybe the student doesn't need accommodation. It's a one-off. There you may not need captions, all right? So just prioritizing the frequency of use, the number of students who will use it, the difficulty, okay? We have spent eight hours trying to remediate a PDF and make it accessible, all right? PDFs are hard to remediate and make accessible. We'll talk about what that means, actually. Um, but other things are much easier. So your syllabus, uh, uh, as it begins as a Microsoft Word document, images in your Canvas site, different things like that. But essentially, what do we mean by uh, accessibility when it comes to electronics? Well, there's, or electronic documentation, there's a number of different aspects to it, but the main one is, will it read correctly to assistive technology? Okay, so somebody who is legally blind is gonna use a screen reader to read this information. I came upon a student once who had his, he was legally blind, he had his monitor turned off and was computing and it was just very striking to me to see that, that he was using his computer without the monitor turned on and listening to every link and every item on the page. 
By the way, the main screen reader these days, or at least one of the most popular ones, is called JAWS. It's made by a company called Freedom Scientific. And just this year, it is very, very inspiring. This program cost about $800 for each user. Students would have to go to get a federal subsidization or state subsidization to buy it and use it. But instead, the Freedom Scientific Company has given it just recently to the CSU. So any faculty, staff, or student can use it. And there's also an at-home version also. So we're about to deploy that on a number of the PCs, if not all the PCs on campus. And we're just extremely jazzed about that. Very cool. Now, it is PC only. That is the bad news. Uh, there are some pretty strong um, accessibility tools on the iOS and also uh, um, the Mac OS. So kudos to Mac for uh, making their operating systems uh, quite accessible. It makes me forgive them for changing the adapters every other year. Okay, so uh, I'm very pleased with that. Um, okay, so it's uh, also iterative, something you can chip away at over t over time. It's, People come out of the gate with their course, their very first course, it's never 100% accessible. Um, so keep that in mind. It's something you chip away at. Okay, I have a lot of resources. This is just my resource slide for you. Again, this is going to be up on the Canvas site, but we've got uh, the CAS site here. Also, uh, as a reading, we talked about um, uh, the Universal Design of Instruction. This is from Cheryl Bergstaller, who is a guru. She runs a Do It program up at the University of Washington. It was a, an assigned reading. It's also in your site. Um, and it talks about things like class climate. It talks about feedback. It talks about um, multiple means of representation, expression. But it goes beyond that. Um, it talks about physical spaces, uh, if they're accessible or not. For instance, what do you do when a fire drill goes off? And the student says, hey, should I take my stuff with me or not? What do you think? What do you think the answer is? The answer is no, but it feels like you should say yes. <laughs> um, it, now, it depends on who you ask, though. Yeah, it could the be. The fire department will tell you, go. Right, so what if it's a real fire? You probably want your stuff with you. OK, so I'm going to. I'm going to uh, lobby for that end of it. Also, um, your dean can tell you or your dean's office where there are gathering points outside of your building. So you can go there and do a head count, make sure everybody made it out. OK. Um, we can talk more about that. We can follow up and get even more um, clarification on that. Let's see. Captioning resources at SDSU, UDL resources, and something that's very, very important, it's the SDSU Accessible Instructional Materials Toolkit. It is a Canvas site that's public. And you can go to it and you say, how do I make Word documents accessible? It's right there. How do I use this um, uh, immersive reader or uh, make things universally designed for learning? It's right there. A number of different things. Um, I may actually even click on it. What the heck? Let's do it. <laughs> and how are we doing on time, DJ? Doing great, John. Okay, great. Um, so you're just seeing I'm going right to the course. So how to use this course? You can either read it front to back, linearly, if you're having trouble sleeping at night or uh, <laughs> something like that. No, you could. Uh, but you can also use it like an index in a book. In other words, you jump around as needed. Here's the SCSU accessibility support contacts. Uh, what is universal design for learning? Tips for accommodating students at SDSU. Um, let's see, what else? Um, accessible techniques, so canvas, images, uh, and tables. So this is stuff, accessible techniques in canvas for documents. Uh, we have something now that makes, and I'd love it if you adopt this, uh, makes um, Google Docs accessible, or at least uh, Google Slides and Google Docs. Um, so how to install it, how to use it, it's a very powerful tool. Um, about captioning, if there's time we might even look at that one. Um, some practice pages. Now this is a public website so you can't make changes here, but I can give you your own version of this so you can play and practice with it, okay? Uh, math accessibility, there's actually things like um, a uh, Audible graphing calculator. So how, if you're if you're legally blind, how do you 
tell where the uh, line on the graph is going. It actually has a pitch to it that goes woo kind of thing. So, John, there was a question. Yes, please. Well, I was wondering if there are recommended tools for testing our own accessibility, like our own material accessibility. Yeah, there sure there sure is. We're going to look at that in just a moment, okay? And. Uh, so I just want to point this out that there's a number of things here and within this also if we go to that document accessibility, I think that's where I put it. Let me double check. Yeah. Accessible techniques, ally for documents, okay, and an ally tutorial. So we have a plugin inside of Canvas that does a few things. It goes next to your pages, it goes next to your documents, and they're not real big here, but it places gauges next to them. Okay, let's see if I can give you a better picture of what that looks like. It places gauges next to them and rates the uh, content's accessibility. So let's see. Let's go, and I am not logged in, that's why I'm not getting what I want there. Okay. Bear with me just for a moment. Can I ask a question? Like yes, that? please. Yeah. I know on my latest course, um, there, I've given the students a bunch of papers to read, and uh, they're all PDFs. Yes. And some of them are really old papers, so they're yeah. like from 1975, and they're scanned yes. PDFs, and they get really low accessibility yes. ratings. And I tried to open them and figure it out, but I could not figure out how to make them more accessible, so okay. what do I do then? Uh, in that toolkit under PDFs is how to run and how to get and run Adobe Acrobat Professional here on campus, it's free, and how to run um, optical character recognition across the document. And it turns it into actual um, uh, text, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, uh, characters, text characters that are uh, editable and speakable, okay? And there's a special technique to doing it, and it's in that video that keeps you from throwing off your layout. However, a really bad scan, sometimes it's rough to get that working. Um, and DJ, did you have a? I was just going to say where, where you went. A really bad scan, some of the letters might get switched around when they're converted from a picture of a page to letters on a page, and you might also capture some some things, some that artifacts, are yeah. images, and you. But you can delete those, and you can edit, and you can correct it a little bit so that it's easier for somebody who's vision impaired to use a screen reader. Yes. Yeah, so it's interesting. We definitely have some older documents that uh, are pretty hard to uh, for OCR to parse through and make accessible. Okay. Here we go. Now I'm in as me, uh, which is good because I get more functionality here. So. For instance, if I click on a page and I go here, you see that little alternative format. So keep an eye on that A in all of your classes, all right? Especially if you teach a language class, we'll talk about that. If I click it, it asks me, well, what do I want? Do I want the article or the PDF or do I want the page uh, to be in alternative formats? And this is open to the students. So I can download an EPUB, which is good for an iPad or other ebook readers, an electronic Braille file that dynamically raises and lowers the dots on a Braille uh, display, uh, a MP3 for listening, a Beeline reader enhanced version for easier and faster online screen reading. So uh, immersive reader, this is that text-to-speech item. Translated version, it actually goes to 50 different languages, okay? And the ones we've checked so far seem accurate, okay? So I just want to point that out, but that could be a little workaround if you're teaching Spanish, right? And your course is in <laughs> Spanish. So you could download things. Just want to point that out. And there is a way to turn that off. Students see those A's. And uh, we've had over 20,000 students use those alternative formats in the last academic year. So they're very, very popular. The other thing to take a look at is if I click edit on this page or next to a document, slowly but surely that gauge comes up. There it is, right there, okay? So that is the other side of Ally, which doesn't display to students. Students, if you have a lot of red gauges, don't worry, the students don't <laughs> see that, okay? So uh, if I click it, it gives me tips on how to make something more accessible. And this is perfect, but let's say it was an image. It would say, add alternative text, and that's for the screen reader to, to speak. 
Um, if, if I click that, it'll say at, uh, 75% add alternative text. It tells you how and what good alternative text looks like. So it can help give you um, tips on how to make something accessible or remediate it. So if I drop a Word document in there, my syllabus, I'm going to get this and it may have a number of recommendations. You need to use headings. You need to work with your contrast. Your images need alternative text. And it'll give you tutorials on most of that, how to do that. So it is a very powerful tool. We actually had 6,000 instructor fixes uh, last year, in the last academic year. Oh, 10 years ago, the fixes were probably um, about five. Okay, oh. so, <laughs> so that's a pretty good number, actually. So uh, we appreciate it. Again, you want to go after the easy stuff first. And let me show you something else here. Go back there. There is for each course an accessibility report. This is Ally again. It's bringing up your course content, talking about what's within the course, what is a severe image, or I'm sorry, severe issue, and then it, it cordons off the low, uh, the, let's see, I'm sorry. It cordons out the easiest content to fix, which is a great place to start. Um, fixing this stuff right here, it might be images, it might be a page, something like that. But I um, just want to point that out. And then your low scoring content, but uh, you can use this for feedback along with those gauges. So you can take those documents and drop them in there and see what it says and see what kind of remediation is recommended. Now you're stuck or you're not sure where to go. Uh, just get a hold of me and I'm going to help unstick you, okay? Happy to help you with that. All right, let's see. Let me come back and make sure I'm covering everything. One other thing I want to show you. Let's go back there. Now, earlier this morning, I had the pleasure of convening our third cohort of accessibility uh, they're actually Universal Design for Learning Accessibility Faculty Ambassadors. Now we've moved all of our stuff from one web service to another recently, and this was just moved. So some of the content uh, still needs to be added back to it. So these, this is the first cohort of ambassadors, and we need to put back the second cohort. That got deleted, but uh, we've got some great people. For instance, Rachel Schlesinger, um, teaches along with Diana Carson disability and society uh, in general studies uh, through the special ed department. Okay, so just some great advocates here. Um, so again, my overarching goal with accessibility and universal design is making a welcoming place for uh, students with disabilities. I've even heard stories like this. A student goes to a faculty member and says, I need to know where all your documents are so I can have Student Disability Services and Candy um, make sure they're fully accessible. And the faculty member goes like this. Oh, that's going to be a lot of work for me. And this was a, this is not a new faculty, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a lot of work for me. What do you think the student did? What do you think the student did at that point? They dropped the class, that's right. Okay, so uh, it's unfortunate. Very much so. I've, I've heard of other stories. I won't go deep into them. How much time do I have left, uh, DJ? It's probably a good time to start transitioning to Q&A. OK, sounds, sounds great. Sounds great. Well, so, I think you should finish the, the topic you just opened there, of course. Um, yeah, so it, just making it a welcoming place. There have been some stories about people, students going to the um, junior uh, writing for proficiency test. and. Um, you're given a certain amount of time. Well, this person gets time and a half. So uh, when they walked in the door, they identified themselves to the proctor, and the proctor said, oh, you're the special one, and handed them the exam. OK, so you know, just big faux pas, big faux pas, <laughs> right? So not making them feel welcoming whatsoever. But yeah, just some uh, different, um, different uh, experiences students have had here, and, and many students have had very positive experiences. Questions about anything or comments? Can I just make a comment um, about the accessible uh, accessibility checker on Canvas? Because we've had this question in our office. 
it will tell you if a video is captioned. It will not tell you if it's captioned correctly. So that's something that you might have to be aware of. Um, I have a list of uh, kind of platforms in my head that don't do automatic captions well. YouTube is one of them. They've gotten better. So that's something to be aware of as well as you're checking video accessibility. Which is a great point. So automatic captions versus uh, human-made captions or human-assisted captions. We get faculty who say, I have automatic captions, so I don't need you. <laughs> okay. And actually, the true definition of captions is it includes grammar. It has speaker designations and, most importantly, ambient sound descriptions. All right, so what if you watch Jaws and you couldn't hear the dun dun, dun dun? That's quite a narrative device. You're missing a lot there. Chains in the distance, dog barking, gunshot, um, who's speaking, different things like that. Um, whereas the automatic captions are really just subtitles in English and they're not even grammatically correct. All right, there's no speaker designation. There's no ambient sound descriptions. So they're a good stopgap measure. And often they are OK, uh, especially in a lecture where you're just speaking into Zoom. All right, there's not a lot going on besides you speaking. So they're still valuable. They're still good to have. But they are not ADA compliant. All right, and we can point you to some captioning style guides and resources if you're interested. Yes, DJ. Just to add to these two points, I sometimes post lectures online. Uh, I like to flip my classroom sometimes. I'll record a Zoom lecture. It will provide captions for me. But also, sometimes I teach ancient Greek theater. Hmm. And I guarantee you that Agamemnon and Clytemnestra are not <laughs> going to be spelled right. In fact, it's going to end up trying to come up with three or four different modern English words that sound like those words. So especially if I'm going to be giving a test where That's I want right. my students to identify or yeah. even know how to spell these terms, I've got to go through my captions and correct them, which I realize may take as much time as I spent delivering that mm. Zoom lecture, but that's just part of my job. I'm making my course accessible to my students. If you want, download the transcript. If there's cons, uh, patterns, uh, if misspellings are patterns, we can do a find and replace uh, to take care of them quickly. But uh, yes, if uh, DJ makes a very good point, if it's a highly important uh, detail you want to make sure it's correct so students don't go off trying to solve math problems thinking that pi is 4.14 when it's 3.14 okay different things like that so yes those cusp uh, uh, important words you definitely want to take a look at those and make sure they're okay and the more esoteric the language uh, it does sometimes uh, have a hard time uh, doing those and so um, yes very good point other questions any other questions or comments okay so I invite you to go to that toolkit you can see captions done automatically and then done properly and it's all around a scene from the birds so there's a little bit of a um, oh a uh, Trigger warning there, okay, not a big deal. But um, anyway, uh, any questions whatsoever? Okay, uh, I greatly appreciate it. I will make sure that um, you have my email address, all right? As a matter of fact, I'll just put it up on the uh, screen here, but I appreciate your attention today very much. And oh, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure, yes, yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, lots of new faces here. Um, May the force be with us all, okay? <laughs> Thank you.